Every great marketer has been faced with this moment, an opportunity to exhibit bravery in the midst of uncertainty or to take a risk on something they truly believed in. The Brave Marketer podcast features today's most progressive marketers and uncovers the brave marketing moments that have shaped their careers and the brands they've influenced. Hosted by Brave Software and Never Stop Marketing and me, your host, Donnie DeVoren, together we'll discover the decision-making process and mindset work that led to their success. You're listening to another episode of the Brave Marketer Podcast. Thank you for your time and putting us in your ears. I think you're going to like today's episode because we talk with Sarah Stringer from Dentsu. And Sarah is going to talk about the attention economy. So not every impression is the same as another impression. And she also talks about shows that are participatory, where the users are actually more interactive and in, in leaning forward into the show, and brands can have a lot of benefit. And then we talk about some of the challenges that are going in our industry, like the death of the third-party cookie and big tech. But before we get into today's episode, we want to highlight our Brave Pick of the Week. So every episode, we choose a brand that has run an ad campaign with Brave, and today we're choosing Wamplay.io. They have been a partner of Brave for the past few months, and they've been running our push notification ads. So our push notification ads are operating system notifications, just like you would see a calendar invite or a CNN news alert. They look like those type of notifications, but they show up when you're using the Brave browser, either on desktop or on mobile. And they're using the ads platform to drive their gaming audience to sign up and play blockchain-based and non-blockchain-based games. Think of it as a gaming platform where you earn rewards while playing. So now in this week's episode, which I mentioned up, up top, you're going to meet Sarah Stringer. She's the EVP and head of U.S. media partnerships at Dentsu Media. And Sarah has come quite some way since she started out in London with her first job in media booking ads for the UK's largest funeral company, which she talks about. And then after making the move from funerals to the music industry, where she spent three years working on universal music before moving to Melbourne, Australia. And then Sarah joined Care Out Australia in 2011 as a strategist, and she was delivering impressive results on brands such as Disney and Nintendo, Adidas, Mattel, and lots of different movie launches like the Avengers and Frozen and, and Star Wars. And if you fast forward to today, Sarah now leads the media partnership team across Dentsu Media in the U.S., working with their biggest partners and identifying the newest innovations to maximize the value for their clients and differentiate Dentsu's offering. So with no further ado... Here's today's episode of The Brave Marketer and my chat with Sarah. Good afternoon, Sarah, and welcome to The Brave Marketer podcast. How are you doing today? Thanks for having me. I'm good. I'm currently in uh, vaccine recovery as of yesterday, so feeling pretty good, but happy I've been vaccinated. Good. Second dose? Second dose. Nice. We have a lot to cover today. So obviously, this is the Brave Marketer, and you work at Dentsu, which is a big agency for a lot of different marketers, and you're doing marketing yourself. And I think the best place to start is with your personal story from earlier on in, in your career. Why don't you share with us how you took some risks early on? Yeah, my first ever job in marketing, believe it or not, I worked for a funeral director brand in the UK. So <laughs> I booked every birth, death and marriage section of every local paper in the UK. And that's not probably the sexiest job that people get into marketing for, but it definitely started me off on an interesting track. And I think that was really my first taste of understanding that if you were happy to lean into a client's business and really think about what you thought was right for them and, and the audience they were looking to hit, that you can get listened to even if you're only maybe a year, 18 months into your career. I'd say that's probably the bravest thing is sometimes just being brave enough to not necessarily overreach, but at least try and take a punt with a new idea and, and see where it goes. Yeah. Can you share some examples of that? Yeah, sure. I think the, probably the biggest move I made in my career was when I'd been in London. I went from working on a funeral director brand over to then a music label, believe it or not. Mm. <laughs> Potentially the largest jump to make in any type of media brand. <laughs> Sounds like a good step up. <laughs> yeah. And after working in London for a few years and working particularly on music labels is not necessarily the most balanced lifestyle. So I went over to Australia and I was working at an agency for six months and 
you know, I found it pretty difficult. Like I'd moved over to Australia thinking that my work-life balance was probably going to be a bit better than I'd expected in London. And it surprisingly got worse. And I remember Mm. one morning trying to get a cab at 4 a.m. after working a ridiculous day at work. And I was like, I can't do this. I need to leave the industry. This is not the job for me. And luckily I had met a guy called Dave Hearn, shout out to Dave Hearn if you're listening, who had interviewed me when I first got to Australia and he reshuffled the team over at Cara Australia and said, look, we have an entertainment portfolio. We'd love to take a chance on you and and move you across to, to run it. And so I ended up becoming the strategist across their full entertainment portfolio. And Honestly, I think the break of moving into that role in Australia, being able to focus my career again on entertainment clients and being able to take risks in doing work that had not been done before. And we were actually KPI'd on media first, a lot of those clients really led me then to the career path I ended up on around innovation because the agency recognized that the work that I was doing on the entertainment brands was things that they should really be expanding into other parts of the business. And so they said, would you mind taking on this new role as head of innovation? And at that stage, I was 28 years old. No one had done that role before in the agency. I had no idea what the expectation was. And they they took a risk on me. And it was amazing because we launched the first ever campaign on Snapchat, even before Snapchat had an advertising platform. We were one of the first brands to ever run a bespoke campaign on Tinder for a chocolate bar, believe it or not. So we did a lot of work that worked around the regular rules of what advertising looked like for brands that were brave enough to give it a try and and behave more like kind of a consumer on the platform versus just uh, sticking to the rules of advertising. So it's been a long journey, but it's definitely fun. And did that take a lot of convincing on the client side to innovate like that and, and have those brave moments? You know what? I mean, you know, it's funny because I think there are a lot of clients who are so brave and they're so open to things. And sometimes I think agencies can sometimes be the gatekeepers and they think that the client's never going to say yes to this. But the more you can bring a client along for the ride, the more likely they are to say yes. And doing anything new means that you create an idea in this perfect vacuum and then you try and apply it to the marketplace And then you realize that it's not going to work the way you expected it to. But having a client who's willing to go on that journey with you means that they're not angry with you when those things, you know, do need to pivot. They're there with you making those decisions. And by the time it comes to market, there's no ownership over the idea. Like you've all done it together. And I think that is what leads to the most successful innovation and in some cases, the most successful way of building trust with your clients, because you're not hiding anything from them. You're not like, oh, God, they're going to be really mad at me that this didn't pan out the way that we were meant to do it because it's never been done before. So I think a lot of clients are open to it as long as you can bring them along for the ride. Got it. So now let's shift into today and thank you for that, that background on on the history. Tell us about your current role and ways you're innovating now. Yeah. So I started a new role over at Dentsu uh, back in October, 2020. So I'd spent uh, nine and a half years at working in innovation at CARA. So half of that in CARA Australia, and then the other half in CARA USA, and then got approached about a media partnerships role. So essentially I lead all the media partnerships from a strategic standpoint in the US. And essentially we work with all of the, the biggest names that you would, you know, think that an agency is working with to ensure that really the offerings we're putting forward for clients are differentiated for Dentsu. We essentially do like an audit amongst all of our different client groups to understand what are the key things that your clients care about? Where do you think the market's going? And and what are you hearing repeatedly that your clients would like a solution for? And then our team will then work with the partners to identify how can we bring those solutions to market whether they be things that are already on their roadmap and it's about ensuring that our clients hear about it and make sure they can implement it as quickly as possible. Or in some cases about building bespoke opportunities for those clients to ensure that we're meeting those demands. So our team really looks after ensuring that those projects move along, but we also create products across Dentsu as well. So we have key work streams in things like the attention economy where we're identifying new values on how we should be approaching media beyond reach and frequency and identifying what are those media moments that draw more attention from people 
How do you compare, say, a social asset to a TV asset and how much attention is that garnering? And so we're building out new rules and research and tools so our clients can identify what does that impact mean. And the thing that's great about it is that we're working with our biggest partners in building out what these frameworks should be. So we're creating tangible ways to implement them. So partnerships is quite a varied role. And we really look at what are those key themes that our clients are talking about and discussing with their day-to-day -day client leadership groups and trying to centralize what those offerings should look like with partners. So we can all move the industry along together. And back to the attention, how do you measure the attention to differentiate between the social post and the TV app. Right. We've been working with some key eye tracking technologies. So we can start looking at just because someone is potentially in a room with a TV, does that mean they're actually looking at the TV? Are they looking at their phone? Are they not even in front of the TV, but that advert is running? And as an advertiser, you're paying full price regardless of whatever that looks like. But the impact that you're getting varies drastically. So we're trying to put different types of metrics around that. So we will look at panel data around a key segment of, of people that will be weighted to the US and then identify of the programming that we've seen and of the data sets that we've recorded, do we envisage that particular moment drove as much attention as possible versus another environment? And some of the outcomes are really interesting because surprisingly, like game shows come out really high, like really surprising data. Mm. <laughs> like game shows actually have a really impressive attention span. And I guess it's because a lot of people who might be watching a game show are genuinely looking at the questions. Am I answering it themselves? Right. You feel They're a bit more completely versus some things that we're noticing is that some sports events are actually not as high, high engagement levels as you may suspect. And I guess that's also because, you know, games can be long. There's obviously quite a lot of advertising during the actual event itself. And by the time you get to an ad break, that is more likely when people are chatting to friends or they're potentially you know, going to the bathroom and so forth. It's been very interesting to start looking at the new ways that we can start like valuing what does that moment look like? And, and is it worthy of the price tag that the market has placed upon it? Yeah. Where do you think the industry is going right now? Like what, what are the hot topics? Where's the innovation? What's changing right now? I'd say engagement is really interesting and in how we start looking at, and again, this sort of harks back to some of the attention story is I think we're seeing gaming have a big influence on the industry and how we're setting new expectations of how people want to interact with brands, objects, entertainment. And we've seen that a little bit with some of the work that Netflix has done with Bandersnatch, which is obviously that choose your own adventure and Black Mirror episode. They tried it again with the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. You can essentially choose the different outcomes, which will provide you with the different narrative as part of that story. So you kind of see the sense of like a, a Red Dead Redemption vibe within a more traditional broadcast environment. And what does it mean if you can be a character that participates in the story versus just receiving a story that has been formulated by someone else. And we're seeing that reflected then in the use of 3D objects. And if you can map your brand in an interesting way into an environment where you get to play with it and can even have a payoff, does it add more value to your experience? Could it be something that you see and you're like, oh no, this is going to make me slower or take some sort of value away from me? So new areas that we're really interested in at the moment really sit around sort of like, again, this idea of sort of participation. We're noticing that key trends that we've seen grow, such as gaming, continue to be a driving force in how we think that consumer experiences will change in the future. And the thing that we're really excited about is that it really puts the consumer in the driving seat of what that experience looks like. We've seen the effect of this sense of like participatory storytelling already roll out through I guess, minimum viable products. You can choose which direction you want to go in, what type of narrative that you can formulate to get to your own endpoint of the story. And I think it's interesting that we're starting to see quite traditional platforms whereby they would normally fully form and package up a whole narrative, but now they're allowing for this sense of interactivity so you can get to a story that you feel like you've had some control over. And I think we're seeing this in, and we will continue to see this in more media experiences, and I think no more obvious where we'll see it is such as the rise of e-com again, that has been such a key trend since the pandemic that we've seen really, I'd say a decade's worth of growth in nine months. 
And as part of that, I think what we're seeing is more interactivity in the way that people want to discover products, how they shop for them, even how those um, products will be embedded into media experiences that you can play with them. And even in some cases, how you get to explore those products in environments where you previously haven't necessarily been able to explore a 3D object before. So we're speaking to a lot of partners, particularly in the gaming space, where your brand can now mean something completely different. Like you can now have to identify what does your brand essence look like if it's adding more value or adding more time, or maybe it's actually a bad thing if it shows up in a media experience. You have these new playful ways that your brand can show up. So we're really interested in that because I think in some cases, when we first saw TV advertising become a thing, people had previously used a radio asset and just put a still image up on a TV. Same thing as to when we saw social launch and you saw people trying to use TV assets and put them into a social environment. And then we saw the rise of the six second because no one wanted to watch a 30 second video right. in a social experience. Right. So, you know, we're sort of in that same position now with gaming assets where why would you put a, even a social asset into an environment where you can tell a completely different narrative. So these are the things that we're really interested in, I think, as we start to explore what does new participatory experiences look like. Yeah. When you talk about some of these innovative things, I start thinking about scale. Is that ever a challenge for you where they're just not reaching enough people because they're just so innovative and new? Yeah. Completely. And this is always the fun part of being a media agency is that you're like, here's the fun idea. And then here's the way that we can amplify all of it. So it's worth the spend. I always personally use the term fireworks and bonfires, which I think some people find really cheesy. But a firework moment is something that feels really interesting and like garners more attention and it gets you on the radar. And then your bonfire is this like constant roar of activity. So you don't go dark. People know that your brand is there. You're reliable. You're showing up like you're not necessarily getting forgotten about. And in some cases, if you don't have the right balance of fireworks to create that big impact, then your bonfire is not going to be working as hard for you because it's like you become like wallpaper. So you need a happy mixture of the two to make it right. And I think particularly as you're looking at new environments, we see the same around podcasting, for instance. If you're going to work with podcasts, yes, you might want some reads from the talent that you're potentially partnering with a particular podcast on, but really to get that scale, you're still going to need to run programmatic audio. Or you're going to make sure that you're running a reach and frequency campaign because you have to have that happy mixture of the two to ensure that you're making both work as hard for you as possible. Absolutely. What about the challenges? Like what challenges does our, our industry face right now? I mean, I think the advertising industry in some cases has become a bit of a negative experience. We've become interruptive. We have become intrusive. We've taken a lot of people's like data without their permission. People are waking up to it. And so I think we have some making up to do. And I think there's so much opportunity around how we genuinely pay people, whether it's a, a basic attention token, whether it's a different type of value exchange, we should be asking people for their permission. We probably always should have been asking people for their permission around how we speak to them and how they opt in. And knowing that an opt-in experience is going to automatically lead to a more positive outcome. It's not intrusive. It's something that people have said, yes, I'm willing to hear from you. And if anything, it elevates brands because brands should be working hard to make sure they're on the radar. But then when they are on the radar, that you're someone that someone has said, I'm going to feel favorably about this brand speaking to me. So I think we have a lot of challenges to overcome, I think, in the next few years around just how negative I think that the industry has become. But I do think that we're in a positive situation where, A, at least we're talking about it now very openly. We have solutions for it now. And also, I think we have more of a, a consciousness about equitable access. How are we making sure that it's not just the same old people getting money funneled towards them? And how are we ensuring that there are more voices, more talent, that we're not just going for the same old partners time and time again, and that we're looking to innovate by understanding that different voices and different platforms contribute different things. As negative as I think it has potentially got around the narrative and, and that people aren't necessarily as trusting of advertising anymore, I do think we have an opportunity to readjust the balance of how we offer more value to people so people don't feel so mad about us showing up, but understand that we can offer some sort of value exchange off the back of it. 
Yeah, and it hasn't quite changed yet. I'm looking at a headline that just came in as we're recording this now. It says, Google smashes sales records as digital ad market booms. So the big tech is still getting a majority share of the money. And that kind of leads into third-party cookies, and you were just mentioning privacy. How much is that coming up in conversation at Dentsu on the media side? Is it a bit of, a little bit of wait and see, and let's see what Google comes up with, like Flock? Or are there a lot of steps that are taken now to get ahead of it? We obviously have our own like ID offering that's proprietary at Dentsu, and we have a varied ecosystem. So Google is part of that ecosystem. They obviously remain to be a very large partner. They're obviously a, a very large part of the media ecosystem overall. But it's important to ensure that we're not just placing all our bets on one partner and also that we continue to have a strong point of view. And we understand that our point of view does make a difference in terms of the types of products that our partners create. So, you know, as much as Google continues to to grow and, and do well in their business, we really view that it's our job to not only partner with them to ensure that we're holding them accountable, but also so we can provide feedback to all of our partners around what do our clients genuinely care about. And you know, what values do they want to be known for and ensuring that those partners are also embedding that into the solutions that they're putting forward. I think this is really where the value of agencies comes in. And it can be difficult, I think, you know, we obviously have a lot of conversations around in-housing, which we're supportive of particular in-housing, but you do also have to have, I think, a third party there to help clients have that broader conversation with large partners to say, this is genuinely something that we think you should be concerned about. And we, you know, we have an aggregate of really important clients who have the same point of view. Right. So we talked a lot about innovation today and what you're currently looking at. Is there something that you're really excited about in, 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 for the future? Like what are your best hopes for the future of marketing and advertising? I hope that we continue to try and hold the the industry accountable. Mm -hmm. I genuinely believe that. It's funny because I think previously we would all joke, oh, advertising is not saving lives. We shouldn't get so stressed out about it. But I think, you know, of what we've seen around the impact that we feel like social media is potentially having on people's own point of view. And we released a, a paper called Same Planet, Different Worlds. We understand that actually a lot of things that have become weaponized about advertising are things that we can have a strong viewpoint on and hopefully support our partners in trying to get to a position where we don't feel like these things have to be binary and that we can try and hold partners accountable for the types of content that is being potentially uploaded onto their systems or the topics of conversation that are viewed as, you know, shouldn't be supported by media funds or should be. And I think we have even more of an opportunity now to try and help create a more positive ecosystem that doesn't necessarily support negative viewpoints, but also how we can try and support and uphold, again, more equitable voices to ensure that we do have a more balanced viewpoint of what's going on in the world. So I think my hope is that we recognize that we do have power to help create change. And I just hope that the industry views that as something that we can help society in creating positive change versus just thinking about it in a, a monetary fashion just to grow businesses. Because I think there's so much more that agencies and brands can do as part of their contribution. This is great. Well, this has been very inspiring for people to take risks. And, and this is a good conversation that we talked about innovation and, and thinking ahead and not just today. So my last question for you is, can you nominate another brave marketer that should be on this show? Oh, good question. Another brave marketer. Maybe one of your um, clients? Do you know what? That's a great idea. I would say Brian Steele from GM would be a good shout. He's doing some really interesting work. He works in the central GM team looking after some of their biggest partner opportunities. And I think that he's a great viewpoint on the areas that they most care about, obviously being very innovative in their viewpoint towards electric vehicles, but also some of the industries that they are supporting as they continue to grow their media diversity, I should say. Perfect. All right. We'll have a chat with him. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Sarah. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Hopefully you enjoyed today's episode as much as I liked interviewing Sarah. And I thought some great takeaways were to think about innovation and 
I liked what Sarah was saying about there's two different buckets of the fireworks and the bonfire and not everything you're going to do is going to be a massive success and you have to test a lot of the things and then once you find it right, think about how to scale it up. So hopefully you took away something good from that. And finally, thanks for tuning into this week's episode of the Brave Marketer Podcast. If you liked what you heard today and found it valuable, it would be super helpful if you took two minutes to leave us a short review in Apple Podcasts. Every review counts in helping us get our show in more ears. And one more final note. If you have a brand, product, or service that you'd like to get in front of Brave's 30 million users, please email us at adsales at brave.com and let us know you're a podcast listener to unlock one of two perks. If your budget is under $10,000 a month, we will bump you up to the top of our self-serve waiting list. Or if your budget is more than $10,000 a month, you'll qualify for a 25% off podcast listener discount. Again, email us at adsales at brave.com. And that we can offer some sort of value exchange off the back of it. Yeah. And it hasn't quite changed yet. I'm looking at a headline that just came in as we're recording this now. It says, Google smashes sales records as digital ad market booms. So the big tech is still getting a majority share of the money. And that kind of leads into third-party cookies. And you were just mentioning privacy. How much is that coming up in conversation at Dentsu on the media side? Is it a bit of, a little bit of wait and see and let's see what Google comes up with like Flock? Or are there a lot of steps that are taken now to get ahead of it? We obviously have our own like ID offering that's proprietary at Dentsu and we have a varied ecosystem. So Google is part of that ecosystem. They obviously remain to be a very large partner. They're obviously a, a very large part of the media ecosystem overall. But it's important to ensure that we're not just placing all our bets on one partner and also that we continue to have a strong point of view. And we understand that our point of view does make a difference in terms of the types of products that our partners create. So, you know, as much as Google continues to to grow and, and do well in their business, we really view that it's our job to not only partner with them to ensure that we're holding them accountable, but also so we can provide feedback to all of our partners around what do our clients genuinely care about? And you know, what values do they want to be known for and ensuring that those partners are also embedding that into the solutions that they're putting forward. I think this is really where the value of agencies comes in. And it can be difficult. I think, you know, we obviously have a lot of conversations around in-housing, which we're supportive of particular in-housing, but you do also have to have, I think, a third party there to help clients have that broader conversation with large partners to say, this is genuinely something that we think you should be concerned about. And we, you know, we have an aggregate of really important clients who have the same point of view. Right. So we talked a lot about innovation today and what you're currently looking at. Is there something that you're really excited about in, 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 for the future? Like what are your best hopes for the future of marketing and advertising? I hope that we continue to try and hold the the industry accountable. Mm -hmm. I genuinely believe that. It's funny because I think previously we would all joke, oh, advertising is not saving lives. We shouldn't get so stressed out about it. But I think, you know, of what we've seen around the impact that we feel like social media is potentially having on people's own point of view. And we released a, a paper called Same Planet, Different Worlds. We understand that actually a lot of things that have become weaponized about advertising are things that we can have a strong viewpoint on and hopefully support our partners in trying to get to a position where we don't feel like these things have to be binary and that we can try and hold partners accountable for the types of content that is being potentially uploaded onto their systems or the topics of conversation that are viewed as, you know, shouldn't be supported by media funds or should be. And I think we have even more of an opportunity now to try and help create a more positive ecosystem that doesn't necessarily support negative viewpoints, but also how we can try and support and uphold, again, more equitable voices to ensure that we do have a more balanced viewpoint of what's going on in the world. So I think my hope is that we recognize that we do have power to help create change. And I just hope that the industry views that as something that we can help society in creating positive change versus just thinking about it in a, a monetary fashion just to grow businesses. Because I think there's so much more that agencies and brands can do as part of their contribution. This is great. Well, this has been very inspiring for people to take risks. And, and this is a good conversation that we talked about innovation and, and thinking ahead and not just today.
So my last question for you is, can you nominate another brave marketer that should be on this show? Oh, good question. Another brave marketer. Maybe one um, of your clients? Do you know what? That's a great idea. I would say Brian Steele from GM would be a good shout. He's doing some really interesting work. He works in the central GM team looking after some of their biggest partner opportunities. And I think that he's a great viewpoint on the areas that they most care about, obviously being very innovative in their viewpoint towards electric vehicles, but also some of the industries that they are supporting as they continue to grow their media diversity, I should say. Perfect. All right. We'll have a chat with him. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Sarah. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Hopefully you enjoyed today's episode as much as I liked interviewing Sarah. And I thought some great takeaways were to think about innovation. And I liked what Sarah was saying about there's two different buckets of the fireworks and the bonfire. And not everything you're going to do is going to be a massive success. And you have to test a lot of things. And then once you find it right, think about how to scale it up. So hopefully you took away something good from that. And finally, thanks for tuning into this week's episode of the Brave Marketer Podcast. If you liked what you heard today and found it valuable, it would be super helpful if you took two minutes to leave us a short review in Apple Podcasts. Every review counts in helping us get our show in more ears. And one more final note. If you have a brand, product, or service that you'd like to get in front of Brave's 30 million users, please email us at adsales at brave.com and let us know you're a podcast listener to unlock one of two perks. If your budget is under $10,000 a month, we will bump you up to the top of our self-serve waiting list. Or if your budget is more than $10,000 a month, you'll qualify for a 25% off podcast listener discount. Again, email us at adsales at brave.com. Thank you.